Thanks, Simon, and um, good afternoon or good morning or good evening, whatever it is in your neck of the woods. Um, welcome to the uh, FACE Business Guide version 3.0, Understanding the Value Proposition of the FACE Approach. So it also gives me pleasure to introduce our two panelists, um, Brendan O'Donnell and Jason York. A little bit about Brendan. Brendan served on active duty in the United States Marine Corps as an AH-1W Super Cobra attack helicopter pilot and instructor. After leaving active duty, Brendan joined the technology and management consulting firm, Booz Allen Hamilton. There he implemented new process to improve major systems development and acquisition with the Department of Homeland Security. Brendan has a broad experience helping acquisition and science and technology program managers develop and manage requirements draft program documentation, and interface with prime contractors. He has supported the FACE Consortium Business Working Group since 2012 and is currently the BWG Vice Chair. Brendan earned a BA in International Studies from American University in Washington, D.C., an MBA from the University of Virginia's Darden School of Business. He is a Darwin Level 3 Certified in Life Cycle Logistics and Level 2 Certified in Program Management. He holds a top secret slash SCI security clearance. Jason York is a senior software analyst contractor supporting U.S. Army Program Executive Office, PEO, Aviation, Matrix from U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development, Command Aviation and Missile Center. He has been an active participant in FACE Consortium for over 10 years, primarily supporting business working group, steering committee and numerous standing committees. Jason is a principal author of the FACE Contract Guide, FACE Business Guide, and Open Systems Management Plan, Data Item Description, and he is currently supports the PEO AVN Modular Open System Approach, MOSA, Transformation Effort in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, Contracting for MOSA Tiger Team. Jason holds a Master of Science degree in Mathematics, Computer Science from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. So over to Brendan and uh, Jason. Uh, thank you, Reggie, for the, the introduction. Uh, uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't know you were going to read all of that. We, we would have punched it up a little bit, but um, but hopefully what you, you all take away uh, from the introduction is that Jason and I have been supporting FACE for a number of years. Um, if, they, if you're not familiar with the overall structure, sort of has a, uh, a couple of different uh, sides to it. One is a technical side where there are folks uh, working on the technical aspects of the, uh, the FACE standard and supporting the FACE approach. Jason and I have been supporting the business side. Um, and uh, what we're planning to do here for about the next 40 minutes is go through some slides to talk through um, Really, that 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 uh, sub bullet there, which is the understanding of the value proposition of the face approach, we have published from the face business working group uh, business guide. You see there, we recently updated that to version 3.0. And, and for folks who may be new to face, that's a great resource for you to go read to really understand uh, from a from a business perspective what face is is trying to do. So. Uh, that, that'll be the topic of the conversation today, and, and uh, we, we hope to leave some time, about 20 minutes or so at the end, to, to answer any questions that come up. And, and uh, we certainly appreciate everybody's time uh, dialing in. So, uh, as I said, uh, as far as agenda for today, we'll talk a little bit about the business guide itself. Uh, so folks know the sort of overall contents and where to go to, to get that information. And, and then we'll cover a lot of the information that is contained in that business guide that really does talk to the value proposition of face. So talk about some of the key goals, the scope of face and, and uh, the approach in, in uh, implementing those, uh, those goals. Uh, a, a large portion of the discussion today will focus on misconceptions about face. So over time, we've, um, as we have supported uh, face and, and, and trying to uh, let people know what what FACE is doing and, 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 and the why behind FACE, uh, we constantly get um, folks coming to, to us with um, either preconceived notions or misconceptions about what FACE is and, or is not. 
And so we hope to address some of those. And it's it's a good way to kind of uh, talk about the face approach um, in, in a fairly concrete uh, way. Um, so we'll go through some of that. The other emphasis for the discussion today will be on, on the face approach and how it supports uh, the, the DOD's uh, desire to implement modular open systems architecture principles. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of go through uh, the most of the principles and, and how FACE supports implementing those. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the value of the FACE approach to, to both government and industry. And uh, it's important to understand that um, um, the FACE is a, is a collaborative approach um, with members from uh, government, industry, academia, and, and all of those folks have uh, interests and, and um, find value in, in what uh, the FACE Consortium is doing. And then at the end, we'll spend a little time uh, addressing any questions that you might have or, or throw it up in for a discussion. Okay, <clears throat> the, the Business Guide 3.0, uh, for those that are familiar with the, uh, the previous two, we, we wanted to, uh, you know, kind of extend that a little bit. And uh, Brendan's already hit some of this. What we want to do, this, this is a marketing tool um, targeted for executives to understand uh, the value of the FACE approach uh, to the government and industry. Um, you know, we, we did put in um, a little bit more detail, the, the FACE approach, the misconceptions. Um, talked about, we want to talk about the scope. You know, a lot of people think, okay, you're targeted toward future platforms. That is absolutely true, but we are also targeted toward enduring fleet. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about how the enduring fleet can can leverage and benefit from the face approach. Um, obviously, uh, very important in uh, in acquisitions is rights and technical data and computer software. So we're going to touch on that a little bit. Uh, this. Uh, guide is publicly available. Uh, you know, there there is the link. Next slide, please. And from version two to version three, uh, th these are really the changes that we that we emphasized. Uh, we tried to you know capture uh, what is in the face approach. It's it's been thrown out for a while, so we we've got you know a good graphic or two that details you know that. Um, we could we could spend you know a couple hours just talking about the common misconceptions. What we found uh, there, there's a, there's a whole lot of misconceptions um, when you talk about open systems architecture approaches. You know in the past, and they think they bring this forward. We've learned you know a good bit from the past, so we'll spend some time talking about those uh, common misconceptions. That information is actually in the business guide. Um, what we've seen recently is a lot of DOD and service specific modular open system approach uh, policy and guidance. So, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, cover that, you know, what came out from the tri services, uh, what came out from each and the individual services. We'll, we'll talk about the NDA and then uh, a little bit lower level, you know, since uh, Brendan and I, uh, you know, both support the Army, uh, what's happening. Uh, uh, lower level, you know, the service and, and how PEO aviation, you know, is addressing that. And uh, then, then we're going to talk, and this is going to be, you know, emphasized here, uh, the FACE approach addresses all five principles of MOSA. And we're going to go over the five principles of MOSA and, uh, and discuss uh, how the FACE approach addresses each one of those in detail. Okay, so to step back just a bit and talk about, you know, what what is what is FACE and, 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 and why the consortium was put together and, and why this approach was developed. Um, and, and you can see there at the, at the end of the day, the bottom line is this is an attempt to get the best avionics software to the warfighters faster. Um, and so the FACE has developed uh, a technical standard. The, the FACE technical standard is an open avionics standard um, for software. And it is, as I said before, developed by the FACE consortium, which has members uh, from, from government, so Army, Navy, Air Force, um, a, a large number of, of industry participants, uh, both large companies and, and, and smaller, more focused companies, and then academia. Um, 
the, the face approach has attempted to define a new architectural and business approach to, to developing and procuring uh, avionics software. So that, um, that approach has te technical aspects to it. So uh, how, do, how does one technically uh, develop an architecture and develop software um, to, to this uh, face technical standard? But equally important, I, I think, in, in the face approach, uh, and as Jason said, from learning from prior open systems uh, architecture approaches is that there's been a lot of time and attention paid to the business processes that support um, being able to uh, develop and procure those um, those uh, software uh, applications that have been developed to the to the face technical standard. The the method for uh, managing this uh, process in, in the in the consortium. Um, it has been uh, done through the, under the auspices of the Open Group. So the Open Group um, uh, really w was the the linchpin in forming the technical standard um, uh, when it got started, uh, bringing together uh, at first the uh, Army and the Navy. Um, but uh, the Open Group provides those uh, sort of bit, those rules for collaboratively developing uh, open uh, open uh, systems approaches. And because of that, everything that, that has been uh, developed by the FACE Consortium are publicly available, published uh, and available for anybody to go uh, download free of charge. Uh, again, different than other approaches um, that have been taken in the past, but, but uh, once things get done and, and are completed through the internal uh, development process, whether that's something like the business guide or the technical standard or a conformance test uh, suite, those are, are made publicly available and anybody, anybody can go download them, develop software to the face techniques. But again, at the end of the day, face is a, is a um, desire to improve the processes for getting uh, that avionics software out to the world. So, so how did we get here? Um, for those that have been around for a while, um, you know that, you know, historically, uh, DOD's airborne platforms have been uh, developed for a very unique set of requirements and usually by a single vendor. Um, and so uh, those, that platform unique design uh, limits uh, reuse of software uh, across the fleet. So, you know, vendor X develops uh, a platform to a highly uh, unique set of requirements uh, by, let's say, one of the services and uh, to to develop software across the fleet uh, becomes um, uh, very expensive because we can't um, port software. Each of those vendors have their own proprietary approaches for, for uh, developing those platforms. There's, there's um, difficulties uh, in, in, like I said, uh, either moving software from one platform to the other or developing software um, across platforms. So it creates uh, high barriers to entry, uh, lots of, or, or lack of competition. And, and what it drives is driven uh, the services to in the past um, are having to bundle new technologies together uh, because the cost of implementing them uh, into an existing platform uh, was so high that, that there had to be sort of a cost benefit um, analysis done to, to actually go in and, and in, in, integrate those new software capabilities into existing platforms. This le leads to learn lo long uh, lead times for software development, even for things that are, that are critically important. Um, in looking at, at developing something like FACE, you know, folks looked and said, hey, the, 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 another issue is that the, the DOD's current acquisition structure for how we how we acquire things doesn't sufficiently support reuse. Um, there, there's not been a commonly set uh, adopted set of open standards uh, for, for those standards that have been attempted in the past. There was uh, really no real effective way to enforce conformance to those standards. And, and on top of that, you know, often the uh, the way that we um, fund our programs within DOD doesn't incentivize uh, software reuse across the enterprise. So, um, you know, those multi-platform requirements uh, often um, 
didn't make it into some of the uh, uh, software capability development efforts. So as a result of the, that, that current state of play, um, folks got together in BOD, uh, again, with industry and said, hey, we think we can improve these processes. So that this face approach that we're talking about is really a response to come to these problems that were identified. So what are some of the key goals and, and, and what's the scope of face? Um, so obviously to improve the affordability of capabilities um, and as importantly, it's to drive down the time it takes to deliver those new capabilities to the warfighter. So folks got together and said, hey, if we can develop some open commonly accepted um, technical standards, define some interfaces, then perhaps we can improve uh, both the ability to uh, share software across our, our, fl our fleets and also reduce the time it takes to integrate that software on, onto platforms. And so, um, you know, so FACE is, is really um, one piece of a larger effort to uh, bring open systems approaches uh, to DOD uh, aviation platforms. Uh, FACE really is looking at, uh, at software specifically there are other open open systems approaches that are uh, looking at things like hardware, sensors, networks, um, and signal processing, those sorts of things. But FACE really is, is really all about avionics software. And, and, and so how, how is FACE sort of operation, operational? Design? <laughs> how is FACE implementing some of these goals? Um, well, as I said before, there was a, a decision made to, to try to um, develop some business processes that support um, uh, what will be uh, changes to, to the way we've historically uh, developed and procured um, aviation software and, and try to incentivize industry to, to adjust to those changes. Um, FACE has defined some technical uh, practices um, to support development uh, to, the, to this uh, open standard. And at the end of the day, Really, it's a component-based software standard that has been uh, developed um, in, in order to uh, support the development of, of portable software. So some of the, the supporting attributes that the consortium has um, identified to support the approach, uh, number one being uh, the desire to accelerate innovation and bring new technology into our platforms. So because of the the, the barriers to um, in, implementing new capabilities that we discussed a bit earlier, um, the, the warfighters are not getting the latest and greatest technology on their platforms. So uh, the, the desire from a from the face uh, consortium perspective is to be able to accelerate how quickly we can get those those new platforms are and reduce barriers to integrating new capabilities and, and enable the, the Department of Defense to pay for new capabilities rather than for um, costs associated with, with integrating those capabilities. Another desire is to be able to enable uh, cross-platform uh, software reuse. So by making the software more modular, portable, the, the belief is that, that we'll be able to support reusing software. So software that, that uh, provides a capability, let's just say largely, uh, you know, just just within the, so the software application, we can take that software um, and, and move it from platform to platform in a way that we can not today. FACE has currently, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, uh, but has implemented a, a software marketplace where folks can go, uh, whether you are a government program manager or you're a systems integrator uh, or you're just somebody who wants to know what's out there that has been uh, developed and, and been through the face conformance process, uh, a marketplace where folks can go dis discover those things. And then the, the other thing that face has been very conscious about is aligning with other open architecture initiatives. So you'll see that face um, within the face technical standard and within the technical approach, face leverages existing uh, open architecture standards. And then there are other uh, open architecture efforts that are that are leveraging the work that the FACE consortium has done. Um, and so they've been very conscious about trying to, um, you know, not reinvent wheels where necessary and also communicating to others 
um, some of the, the benefits and approaches or lessons learned from uh, the work that the consortium has done. So to support some of those things from a, from a business perspective, uh, FACE has stood up and, and has implemented a conformance program. So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but uh, there's a process by which a uh, software developer will get their, their product um, verified that it, that it meets the FACE technical standard. And then that that uh, that software application will be certified to to be available for folks and published in the, uh, the the registry of applications. So anybody can go discover that product that's been developed. Uh, the registry is the place that's sort of the app store where where folks can go look today and see what applications have been developed. And then we've also developed a uh, series of um, of guides of publications and put a lot of uh, intellectual energy into uh, helping folks um, support the business processes that are that are required for this this sort of new approach. So uh, something like the face contract guide that Jason was uh, heavily involved in developing is, is really aimed at uh, both program managers in a, in a government office. If you need to write an RFI or an RFP for uh, an application with with face requirements, we have a, a sort of a checklist and, and, and uh, common language or example language that, that folks can use. Um, and also for, for folks who are in industry and need to respond to those RFIs and RFPs, that's a resource that folks can use to, um, um, to, to guide them in those responses. So FACE for, for, for a few years when Jason and I first started uh, supporting FACE was very future looking, trying to define processes for how we were gonna uh, do this conformance program or what's the registry gonna look like. Um, but, uh, but FACE to, you know, today is operational, it's up and running. Industry is, is using software product lines uh, to, to build applications to the FACE standards. Um, there's expertise available, so if you are you are new to the FACE consortium, or you're new to trying to understand what FACE is all about, and you want to develop an application to the FACE standard, there's lots of folks uh, within the consortium. There's uh, training that's that's coming out, um, um, certified training that's being worked on right now for folks to be able to, to um, develop applications to the technical standard. So the bottom line is there's, there's, there's lots of expertise out there on, on how to do this from a technical approach. Um, and, and, and you can go in the registry right now. Uh, you can see there's units, units of conformance, which are is the face term for for those things that that go through the conformance process that are listed there. There's 14 suppliers that are, that have uh, gone through that process and then have things listed in the registry. Uh, the bottom line is face is up and it's ready and it's uh, available for use. Okay, the uh, the common misconceptions. Uh, we built this list and uh, kind of revised it, you know, over the last several years. We do a good bit of outreach uh, to uh, platforms, PMs, uh, and I know the other services too. And these are these are some of the common or the most common misconceptions uh, that we hear. And uh, so, so we want to just, uh, you know, go through, you know, each one of them. We'll we'll have a slide, you know, for each. But here, like I said, here here's the six most common. And then uh, I hand it off to uh, Brendan, and uh, we'll, we'll just go back and forth uh, going through these. So, so, so the first one in that list is that all so all software on a, on a platform must be face conformant. So this is a common thing that folks come to say, hey, you know, if I you know if I have to um, you know build all my my software on my platform to face, either that's going to be prohibitively expensive or it doesn't make any sense because I have a fielded platform, but. You know, FACE is, is uh, the intent of FACE is to promote portability and reuse. Uh, there are there are times where, uh, let's just say, an upgrade to an existing platform or uh, a, a development effort uh, may may not make sense to um, uh, to to be FACE conformant. So, if there's no intent or there's no benefit for a particular uh, software application to be reused um, or to go into the registry and, and for other folks to know about it, um, then it, then your application you know, doesn't need to be uh, developed to the FACE standard. Um, it's really a, a kind of a business case decision um, uh, for the PM 
on a case by case basis what what needs to be or what should be uh, potentially reusable software that would be a candidate for going through the face conformance pro conformance process and, and what wouldn't make sense to do that. The, the other the other thing to understand is that um, that there's no you know face um, the face conformance program su supports uh, conformance for units what we call units of conformance where the the interface the interfaces of a software component component are uh, analyzed and, and verified to conform to the technical standard. FACE does not, um, there is, there's no FACE sort of system level uh, conformance or FACE platform conformance. Um, so, so a platform or a system can be made up of, of all uh, software units of conformance that, that have been through the FACE standard. It can, it can have software applications that, that are, that are, or it can have software applications some of which are face conformant, some of which are not. And there's no reason why uh, those two things can't exist on the same uh, either sub subsystem or a platform. So one of the common misconceptions is that uh, the face approach only applies to future systems. This is absolutely not you know, true. Obviously, it can, it can definitely benefit future platforms because it has the ability to design you know, from the beginning. So you set up your uh, you know, face infrastructure, computing environment. So, you know, from the from the very beginning, um, you know, you can host face conformant software. Uh, the enduring fleet, you know, that they have, um, they're up and flying legacy, um, you know, designs and architectures. There is many integration patterns uh, to, to set up this infrastructure. I mean, adjunct mission processors, you could have, um, uh, spare processing power uh, in, in your mission processor, or you could have it in your ASE suite, or you, you know, some, some places have, or some platforms have uh, smart displays, and, and we're kind of going away from that, so that, that may be a resource that we can use uh, to, to implement that. There, there's quite a few integration patterns that the um, uh, legacy platforms, you know, can realize, and, and what really helps with the legacy platforms, in addition to cost savings, it helps address obsolescence issues. If if they have something, you know, going, uh, you know, obsolete, uh, they can look in the registry, and if it if it satisfies their need, they can pull, you know, from the registry, work with that, you know, software supplier, and, and integrate, and and avoid that NRE and uh, and, and the time there. So there is. Uh, you know, cost avoidance. Government's not not in it to save money. We we want to cost uh, avoid as much as we can, where we can provide uh, more and more capabilities to the warfighters. So the next common misconception is that that face either either ensures uh, and the face conformance process either ensures or inhibits performance. And and, and like I said. Before this is this is a, a really a, a you know a, a conversation about the face, the business approach and the value proposition. So not to get too technically uh, in the weeds, but but the face technical standard and the face conformance process um, doesn't specify or guarantee functionality or performance. So it doesn't relieve the, the the systems integrator or the project manager from their systems engineering responsibilities to uh, adequately adequately assess. How well a, a software application um, um, performs its technical mission. So the face conformance process really is only looking at those uh, technical interfaces and do they um, align to the, the requirements um, developed in the face technical standard. Um, so if your uh, you know your your calculator uh, software application. Um, takes two plus two and, and comes up with five, uh, FACE is not looking at that performance of, of that calculator application. It's only looking at whether the uh, the software interfaces align to the FACE technical standard. So uh, another misconception that we hear a lot is that the FACE approach requires unlimited data rights. That is absolutely not true. Um, um, in, in, in fact, uh, the government can't afford uh, all the IP, and if the government could afford the IP, 
what, what are what are we going to do with it? Because uh, because a lot of times the the SMEs reside, you know, in industry. So what we've really focused on is what the other uh, you know software acquisition is focused on, and that is open interfaces and a modular design, uh, prefer, preferably a government prescribed modular uh, design if we can you know achieve that. So. The FACE approach really enables the software suppliers to protect their IP, you know, within their applications. We're just interested in keeping the uh, interfaces open uh, to promote uh, competition and innovation. Something else we, 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 we've heard, you know, particularly early on when, when FACE was getting going, that there were concerns that FACE was going to be uh, Another layer of, of requirements levied on a PM um, or, or a systems integrator, and that it was going to be um, uh, cost and schedule prohibitive. Um, you know, face as as we mentioned earlier, the the all of the products of the face consortium are uh, open, non proprietary, free of charge. So there's no licensing or um, you know any of those sorts of costs that, that uh, would restrict. Um, Developers from developing something that says to, to the technical standard. Uh, there's no royalties or or any kind of restricted covenants uh, when it comes to the actual face technical standard. And and um, what we've I think heard from our industry partners is that there are definitely uh, benefits from uh, developing to the face approach. That there are there's efficiencies to be gained uh, by using standardized interfaces um, that support you know. Developing uh, software product lines and being able to scale uh, technologies across platforms. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the benefits to industry, but that that's certainly one of them. That ability to uh, to scale technologies across platforms. So in the last one here, I won't spend too much time on it because uh, we've already. Well, no, actually, this one this one's different. Um, so. The face technical standard does not uh, you know, specify or guarantee compliance with safety certification standards like mill standard 882, um, you know, or you know, on the on the uh, civil side, FAA um, uh, DO 178. Um, we we have uh, you know a recent effort that's being uh, ran in our enterprise architecture group to kind of look at uh, you know airworthiness requirements. In the past, uh, we have um, on the Army side, uh, we looked into, into that and developed a developer's requirements guide for airworthy and re reusable, you know, UOCs. Um, that that is specific for the Army, but it but it is it relates to the face approach. Uh, that is publicly available. Uh, if anybody uh, would like a copy of that. Uh, you know, please, uh, you know, contact Reggie, uh, contact me, and, and I'm happy to, uh, provide, to email, provide you uh, a copy of that. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, value to the government, um, and, and I, I've got, you know, more slides, you know, coming up, but we have to address policy and mandates as, as they come out. So we've seen over the years, uh, you know, open interfaces recently, uh, a lot of policies on MOSA uh, to use of open standards and, you know, have uh, a way to verify uh, that those uh, approaches. Uh, we're looking for, you know, affordability. Uh, we're, we're trying to do more with less. We want to uh, extend our money. And uh, in addition to that, we want to provide these capabilities to the warfighter as fast as we can. Uh, and then one way to do that is to reuse. Uh, so, you know, reusing the capabilities and making, you know, capabilities enabled by software portable to platforms is a is an excellent way uh, to do more with less and, uh, and and make this available on multiple platforms. Next slide. Okay, I, I mentioned the uh, the recent guidance uh, on MOSA. Uh, just wanted to recap that a little bit. Um, and, and just, uh, uh, you know, before I really get into this, uh, I didn't, I didn't go into detail, didn't, you know, have a slide on the National Defense Authorization Acts. Uh, two very important ones was the one in 17, 
uh, which really pushed MOSA in the acquisition strategy. And the context in the push was really for major system interfaces and, and making sure, you know, that those are open and um, wouldn't be, you know, proprietary. And that, that kind of, you know, fosters the, uh, the competition and prevent vendor lock. What we saw with the latest one, the NDAA of 21, um, we saw that go down a level to modular system interfaces and, and the drive is, is really focused on interface and interface delivery. And uh, there's actually language in there. Uh, government's gonna make uh, best effort, even if developed at private ex expense, uh, to uh, acquire GPR on those interfaces. Uh, just because we're, we're interested in promoting innovation and preventing, you know, vendor lock. So, you know, that being said, those NDAAs are, are out there. So, um, with the with the tri services, you know, DoD, you know, we saw a couple years ago um, a, a memo come out, and it specifically called out uh, the face technical standard, and you know, a couple of quotes there: continued implementation of these standards is vital to our success. Our success. Um, the services, all three of the services followed that up. Uh, Secretary uh, of the Navy issued some guidance. The Army Acquisition Executive uh, issued some guidance. And then the uh, Secretary of the Air Force, you know, issued guidance all, all related to MOSA and how that would be implemented. Um, I, I, can, I can go in just a little bit more detail. I've got, uh, you know, more visibility on the Army side. That Army Acquisition Executive um, memo empowered uh, ASALT, the Office of the Chief System Engineer specifically, uh, to develop a MOSA implementation plan. That was actually released uh, in June of 2020, and it spe uh, specified requirements for PEOs and uh, program managers on, uh, on their, their recommendations um, to address MOSA, you know, in their enterprise. Uh, PEO Aviation uh, made a significant effort and set up a MOSA uh, transformation organization uh, to address uh, those in, in, in several different areas, um, provided that and uh, got absolutely outstanding feedback, uh, you know, on the, on the approach for the Army side. And, and it looks like uh, PEO Aviation is kind of leading the way and uh, will be an example for the Army. That, that was actually a direct quote from the Office of the uh, Chief System Engineer. They, they were very happy, uh, you know, with that. Next slide, please. So one thing that I failed to mention is in the ASALT MOSA implementation plan, um, the, it is aligned to the five principles of MOSA. I've got the principles uh, listed, you know, on the left here in blue. And um, the FACE approach, uh, you know, was designed um, to address all five of the uh, principles of MOSA. So the first one is establishing an enabling environment. You know, we've done that. We've got a tech standard. We've got data architecture. We've got tools to support, you know, testing, change requests, problem reports. We've got, you know, guidance on implementations. We've got, uh, you know, a, this not doing it credit, but you know, a, a face software hello world boss. It's it's a lot more you know detailed than that. There's there's training uh, available. There is a course accreditation effort uh, to accredit a course from third party you know suppliers. As Brendan mentioned earlier, capabilities in the registry. Uh, we we have support on the business side. Obviously, we're covering the the uh, the business guide today, which is really a marketing tool. Why? you know, the face approach benefits government and industry, but we have tailorable contract language, you know, in the contract guide, you know, it not only covers RFPs, RFIs, it covers BAAs and OTAs. Uh, so I, I encourage people interested, you know, in that, you know, pull that, uh, you know, modular design, face reference architecture, we define uh, five architectural segments. And there's also, there's a data architecture um, and, and it goes into great detail about the shared data model, the, the single shared data model, uh, the ability to uh, develop domain specific data models to help in, encapsulate, basically it extends the shared data model. It's not required, but a, a lot of the government efforts, we want to uh, develop the shared data model where we can put, put that on contract. And then the user, the USM, the user supplied 
or ULP supplied model. Um, so we have those. Obviously, key is uh, design, designate key interfaces. Uh, in you know the face interfaces are the the OSS, the iOS, and the TSS. Um, face is a it, it is an open standard, but it is a collection of open standards. We hadn't reinvented the wheel. We use uh, standards that are out there. I, I just listed a few here: A rank 653, 661, OpenGL, POSIX. You know, it goes on and on. And one of the things that really separates uh, the FACE consortium and the FACE approach from other uh, open system uh, architecture initiatives is the conformance program. We have a, a conformance program that's operational. Um, you know, it, it, you, you go through verification, you go through conformance, you go through registration. If you meet all uh, three of those, satisfy all three of those, you get to go in the registry, which is a, you know, card catalog. Brendan, uh, uh, Discuss that earlier and showed there's there's actually 25 uh, entries now, and we know there's quite a few more you know in the pipeline. So uh, that that number uh, continues to grow. Next slide. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we've talked a bit about the, the, obviously the the benefits from the government side and the desire to be able to get uh, capabilities to the warfighter faster. Um, which I think everybody who's involved in, in developing uh, software for DOD aviation systems is interested in, uh, least, you know, particularly folks that are that are doing that work in industry. Um, and, and so the there's a large number of industry participants. If you go on the face website, you can see who they are. But some of the the the, the value that they find in the in the face approach. That, that uh, number one, they are able to satisfy the customer and the customer's requirements for things like MOSA um, to support their desire to more rapidly um, uh, implement capabilities to uh, to su to uh, support the ability to 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 reuse software across the fleet, um, and so that they're they're they are addressing the customer's uh, needs. Um, there, there's also opportunities. Um, by aligning to the face approach for industry to increase revenue and market share. So, um, you know, obviously there are, and if you, if you, if you see things that are coming out, uh, RFIs and RFPs, uh, there, there, there are face requirements in them. And so if you are a member of industry and you have some expertise in developing software applications to the face standard, you are going to be uh, ahead of your competitors. Um, by uh, pursuing the face approach, there's also, a, I think, a benefit for, um, for future platforms, particularly for companies to be able to compete over the life cycle of those future platforms in a way that if uh, there were not a face approach, they may be locked out. And so by having those open standards, you know, uh, uh, companies may be able to compete in a way they couldn't previously uh, for, for future efforts. And then, uh, you know, the bottom line for industry, uh, for those publicly, uh, for, for, for companies that are publicly traded particularly is to improve their shareholder value. So um, all of those things we've talked about, being able to support the customer's requirements, be, uh, be more competitive than their peers, uh, really does support uh, uh, a real return on, on, on those investments in, in supporting the face approach. Um, Again, Jason mentioned earlier that uh, FACE is not solely focused on the on the future fleet, but but there is there's well, and, and that is definitely true. There's there's I think a vision to be able to uh, bridge between the future fleet and and the current uh, enduring uh, platforms. Um, you know, while that transition to the future fleet is happening, so um, um, there are, there's work right now going on to uh, bring FACE to to um, to existing platforms. Um, obviously, in the future, all of those things that we've talked about, um, as far as the, the benefits of the face approach, uh, we, we certainly envision those uh, coming to fruition for, for, for future platforms for to support new design systems level upgrades. Um, we want to be able to increase the, the pace at which we're able to field uh, incremental capability improvements um, on, on our future platforms, you know, reduce complexity and, and be able to uh, port software. And, 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 and again, 
uh, ensure our warfighters are getting the latest technology without having to pay for those uh, integration costs. Um, so for the Enduring Fleet, there's investments being made to be able to uh, bring uh, applications built to the face technical standard to the Enduring Fleet. Uh, Jason mentioned some of the, the benefits around obsolescence. Um, uh, and then also, you know, some of those uh, software development efforts for the current fleet uh, really do have an eye towards, you know, uh, bringing those forward uh, once some of the, uh, the future looking platforms um, uh, mature a bit. So the, uh, the data rights, uh, we, we talked about, you know, this earlier and the, the, the takeaway here, FACE does not levy additional data rights other than, you know, what, what's typical in software acquisitions. Um, we encourage the program managers to develop the data right strategies, recommend uh, that really focus and identify the most frequently changed pieces. You got to understand the DFARs and obviously with the recent guidance really need to go after open interfaces and uh, try not to get locked in to one vendor. We want to promote uh, competition and promote innovation. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of times, um, you know, we, we, we have to look at near term, but we also have to look at long term and, uh, you know, extended life cycle, you know, costs. Uh, we recognize that industry invests their capital uh, to enhance innovation and, and to give them a competitive advantage. Uh, you know, we, we are, uh, you know, happy, you know, happy with that. We want to be able to protect their IP. We just don't want to get locked in if there is a, another uh, vendor out there. Uh, that has, you know, a better product. Um, so, you know, we, we, want, we want to kind of push the envelope uh, as far as vendor independence and, uh, and, and keep the, you know, the, the market, you know, for the, for the best of breed. So we want to thank everybody for their time today. Uh, we've got about, I think, 12 minutes left for, for questions. Um, if there's anybody who wants to know anything more about uh, the information presented, certainly in, in this brief, um, you can contact uh, uh, me, Brendan, or Jason uh, directly. Um, if you have other questions about FACE that, that may be not uh, particularly uh, business related or more technical in nature, um, and you want us, you, you know, you need help uh, directing those questions to somebody who might be able to help you out again. Please reach out to Jason or I, and, and uh, we'd be happy to facilitate those conversations. So, um, Good. Uh, so that, that being said, um, I see a couple questions there. Um, yep. If there's others, uh, Simon or Reggie, uh, please let us know. But um, but we're standing by for your questions, and thank you again for your time. Okay. One of the questions, um, Jason or Brendan, we've got: Is there a face equivalent for the Army and Naval branches of the forces? Jason, you want to take that? Sure. So, uh, you know, th this isn't, you know, specific for the government, specific for a service, or, um, you know, specific for the uh, aviation domain. Th this is a freely open uh, standard, so it's it's applicable, uh, you know, across, you know, the board, and, and um, so, I mean, any service can use it, um, any, you know, industry can use it, and, and we've seen um, this being used, uh, you know, in other industry, the oil refinery industry, the medical industry. Um, so ho hopefully that answers your question. I mean, uh, if, if you find benefit in it, it's freely available to use. Yeah, there is there is a face technical standard, and there there are um, there are tools and processes that have been published to support the face technical standard. And it's not an army standard or a navy standard or a, you know uk mod standard it is just the face technical standard okay another question what are the implications for national security and application security jason yeah there is a, uh, a security group um, subcommittee, a, a part of the technical working group that, that addresses security, uh, you know, issues. Um, I, I don't really understand uh, about national security, but uh, uh, th th there is an effort, um, 
you know, to, in, in the technical working group to, to address security. And there's different profiles. There's the general purpose profile, there's the safety profile, and there's the uh, safety extended um, profile. That's, uh, that's kind of getting in the, you know, the technical side and uh, um, th does that, does that answer the question? Yeah, the other thing I would say is, is, is as, as, as we've stated a couple times today, all of the, the work products that have been developed uh, by the FACE Consortium are, are publicly available. Anybody in the world can, can log into the Open Group Book Store and download those things. Uh, however, the, the members of the FACE Consortium that develop those products are actually US restricted to US persons only. And so uh, that, that, I don't know if that uh, addresses your question. So while the, the, uh, the end products are, are all publicly available, certainly uh, in the development of those products, there was uh, attention paid to, uh, I think the concerns, the, quest, the, the, uh, the question raises. Okay. Is space available for non-US forces? Yeah, uh, the technical standards publicly available. Uh, they're the, the uh, all of the supporting um, software development kits and, and test tools and all of those things that have that are completed development uh, within the consortium are publicly available. Um, so anybody can go download them. Uh, there, there's actually some conversations ongoing about um, uh, lifting that U.S. persons only restriction for members of the FACE Consortium. That hasn't happened yet, um, but um, but there's certainly a lot of international interest in this in the FACE technical standard. Anybody can go uh, uh, get that information. Okay, there's a question here. It looks like um, within this question is like three questions. So I'll address them one at a time. Is there a possibility to use space in do dash 178C DAL a certified software for civil type certified aircraft. In any examples or known projects that are trying to achieve this, in any vendors doing stuff there, any thoughts on applicability for civil stuff? You got all that? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the misconceptions, and um, it is, you know, face does not guarantee or prevent, um, you know, airworthiness. So uh, what we found, and, and I can't I can't give much details about here. Uh, we, we've uh, executed several creatives with industry partners to help you know mature you know the face you know technical standard, um, but but ab absolutely and uh, through the conformance program, a lot of the um, the industry partners that we're under creatives with, they used uh, some of their. Um, airworthiness artifacts to satisfy some of the the, the conformance uh, verification matrix, you know, requirements. Uh, if you're asking for a specific example uh, where where we applied it, I won't, I won't name the the vendor, but it is, is a middleware supplier um, was able to achieve you know face conformance, and their product is uh, DALA certified. And I'll just say, if you go on the, the opengroup.org slash uh, face, which is the, the main face uh, website, you go to the members uh, page, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll see lots of uh, companies that support both, uh, you know, avionic systems for, for DOD and, and the commercial industry also. Okay. Um, this question, I guess I could answer this one. Um, can we get the presentation? And that will be posted. So, yes, you will be able to get it. Um, Okay, another question. Some industry competitors who currently invest in maintaining incumbency for their vertically integrated system, their platform, their cockpit, may view the deconstruction of their product into separate, severable, and compatible components as a disincentive to invest. In that contents, where does space stand in maturity in terms of production programs and number of UOCs in production? In other words, how reliably can one predict their return on investment in terms of production revenue stream? It's a big one. So obviously, um, you know, one of the themes here for the face approach, we are really promoting competition and open interfaces, but it's not just us. Uh, the, the DOD with the MOSA guidance uh, that, that came out 
and you know one of the you know the key principles is designate key interfaces have a modular design so there there is a push you know for the government uh to have you know the open architectures you know the best breed capabilities and it, it really empowers um you know the, the smaller vendors and to be able to play in these markets which has typically been dominated by a platform prime contractor um you know one of the things that we saw, and I, I didn't talk about this, you know, a whole lot, uh, but, you know, the ASALT MOSA implementation plan, it's aligned with the five principles of MOSA, and they made it very clear that they expect in acquisition strategies that MOSA is a discriminator. So if you, if, if, I mean, that, you know, that that's clear, and when solicitations, you know, come out, uh, if, if you offer uh, proprietary interfaces, um, that is going to be, you know, a, a, a negative, you know, based on the guidance, um, you know, at, at least, you know, on the Army side, and I suspect, you know, similar guidance has, has came out uh, with the other services. Okay, I think we have time for probably a couple more questions. And, and just, just on that, I would say, you know, there's lots of companies that have come together in the FACE Consortium to develop the, the the face approach, both the technical uh, pieces of that and, and, the, and, the, and the business uh, uh, things that have been done to support the, the technical approach. Uh, but those companies are still competitors. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, they're all doing that uh, return on investment analysis, um, you know, individually. And for some companies, this, you know, this will be a change to their business model. For some, it may be a threat. And for some, it will open up. Uh, uh, great deal of opportunity. Okay, OMS slash UCI and FACE appear to be competing standards. And is it difficult for industry to support both? Do you see the government heading toward one standard versus the other? So I, I think they can coexist. I mean, if you're, if you're asking specifically about OMS, there, there's definitely differences. Uh, OMS was developed kind of kind of restricted by invitation, uh, you know, only with just uh, you know a, a select few uh, you know companies participating. As far as I know, uh, they do not have a conformance program. Um, you know, similar to Face, Face is, is basically a um, um, collaboration of the willing uh, uh, decision to go through the open group. Industry comes and participates. Government comes and participates. What we develop is uh, is freely available uh, and open, and we do have a operational uh, conformance program, which hits that fifth um, uh, key principle of MOSA is to certify conformance. Okay. Uh, one other question: the Balser examine uh, yeah, example does it appear to be publicly available? Can you provide yeah. the correct link to obtain such information? It is publicly available. Um, well, it it is it has been approved for public release. Uh, that is being uh, worked. It was actually developed, you know, by the Army. Uh, we've approved it. We're working out the details, you know, with the open group, uh, you know, with the expectation that that uh, version, I think it's 3.1.13, uh, you know, will be uh, publicly available uh, through the open group website. Yeah, those are all that's all the questions um for now i think there's one more that was put in chat oh in chat hang on oh is there a face linux version thanks me did you hear me i did um you know face really targets you know posix and a rank 653 um Many of the developers uh, will use a um, CentOS, which I, I believe CentOS is a um, real-time Linux variant. And uh, the, the te technical folks, you know, can correct me here. Um, you know, to that's that's a lower cost way, you know, to to do development and then port to the actual uh, real-time operating system. I don't know if I'm specifically answering the question. Uh, but there, but you, but you can use uh, CentOS, you know, for development. Okay, 
So that there, there's just one more in there, Reggie. It's right above it. I can read that. Can, can you address how face can impact platform um, other than VPX? Is it worth it? Most it kind of requires VPX. So I'm definitely not a hardware expert, um, but you know, face is a the face tech standard is a component based standard for software uh, and, and we've made a push to be hardware agnostic. So um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of maybe open VPX addresses, um, you know, the definition of MOSA and, and uh, you know, the, the, the principles. Um, but, but I don't, I don't think you have to be VPX uh, to have a modular open system approach. Okay, there is a comment um, on the chat that VPS is a hardware standard, nothing in face is specific to VPX. And you can use face GPP on any Linux from Mark Snyder. Very well, if that's all the questions, I we yeah, certainly thanks. appreciate everybody's time. Um, you know, like I said, if, if folks have uh, want, want to get into more in depth discussions or want to take something offline, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Jason or I. Our contact information will be in the, uh, the slides that Reggie posts. Okay. Great Thank job. You. And the presentation will be available um, on the website, on the FACE website. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Simon. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'll end today's presentation now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.